How much can you change without losing your identity before you become a different kind of person? How much can a city change before it becomes a different kind of city? Or a forest? How much can you change a forest before it starts to function and to look like a different kind of forest? All of those questions are about resilience. And what I want to do is explain a little bit about the basis of resilience. And it all has to do with the notion of self-organization. All those systems, because that's what they were, are self-organizing systems. Your body is a self-organizing system. You maintain a constant temperature of about 38 degrees centigrade. If you go up a bit and you get hot, your body starts to sweat. And you evaporatively cool and your body temperature comes down. If your temperature goes down, you shiver and your muscles vibrate and your body temperature goes up. But there are limits to that. And there are limits to how much everything can change. And that's what resilience is all about. It's how do you maintain the self-organizing capacity or ability of a system. And, and let me explain it by, again, coming back to the body. And what I'm going to do is uh, describe some work of a colleague of mine. He's a professor of trauma surgery in Washington University in Louisiana, Tim Buckman. And he gets people into his surgery who are just about dead. They've been shot and mangled in accidents. And he has some terrifying pictures of people with half their liver shot away, most of their blood gone, almost dead. And I'm going to use a little metaphor, an analogy that scientists use to explain uh, resilience and self-organizing. And it, it's about a ball or a cup in, uh, and a ball in a basin. And uh, what it is, is it says that this is the system, and this is how much you can change. This is your body temperature, or this is how much a forest can change. And if the body, if you put it up there, whatever it is, you change the system, it will tend to come back down to this equilibrium point. If you put it up there, it will tend to come down to that equilibrium point. But there are limits. And if you go over the limit, then, and the ball lands up there, then it goes down to something else and it goes to a different kind of system. Well, coming back to Tim and his trauma surgery, he, from what I understand of his work, says that he gets people in who are in what he calls the death basin of attraction. This is the live basin of attraction. And he gets people in who are about there. So they're not dead yet. They haven't reached the attractor, as it's called, of this basin of attraction. But they're on their way. And unless something is done quickly, they die. And so when they come into a trauma surgery, the body is stabilized. They hook them up to put blood in, to maintain the temperature, to keep the respiration up, to keep the blood pH constant, all sorts of things. The body is hooked up to a bunch of wires and stabilized. In effect, what he says he's doing is he creates a little temporary basin of attraction, which is an artificial one, and he maintains it, but it stops the person dying. And then they sit and wait, and they watch to see what happens. And sometimes what happens is that this one begins to change and erode and go down, and when it does, the body recovers, it self-organizes, and it's alive. Unfortunately, all well, too often, what happens is it's this one that arises, and then the person dies. Now, Tim is a good observer, and he noticed that when the body is in this suspended state there, it's constantly trying to change. The body temperature is trying to drop, or the respiration rate is trying to go up, and so he wondered, and he got a bunch of rats, and he did an experiment with them and he anesthetized them to do it properly and carefully. And half the rats, when he, he subjected these rats to the same kind of, of trauma, half their 
liver gone and most of the blood out and everything else. And then he stabilized them using the same protocols. And for half the rats, he kept them exactly according to the protocols. But for the other half, if the bodies tried to change, if the temperature began to drop, or the respiration went up, he let it go up. He let the temperature drop until just at the point of death. But basically he let the body vary the way it wanted to. And the result was amazing. A significant increase in the survival rate of the rats who were allowed to vary. And so the important message out of that was that the way you maintain the resilience of a system is by allowing it to probe its boundaries. If you never burn a forest, the species in that forest that can capable of putting up a fire eventually get outcompeted and they disappear. The only way to make a forest resilient to fire is to burn it. If you keep children inside and away from dirt and eating it and getting dust, they become very prone to all sorts of diseases and asthma. The only way to keep children resilient to the environment that they live in is to expose them to it and to disturb them in that environment. So it's all about resilience is maintained by disturbing and probing the boundaries of resilience. Otherwise, this basin tends to get smaller and smaller. And we don't want that to happen. So that's the message of resilience. I'll come back quickly to your own body and the temperature one that I talked about. Why is it that you maintain a temperature of 38? Very close to death. If you get over 41, you're dead. Well, the reason is, the earlier models of us hominids, who may be kept at 35 or 6 degrees, they weren't as efficient as us, so we outcompeted them. They're in the hominid records in the archaeology back there. But we've had 10 million years of mammal evolution to develop the feedbacks, physiologically and behavioral, that stop us going over that 41. Not always. Some old people and some babies die. But generally speaking, humans don't cross that boundary. So, what is it that prevents that? There are a whole bunch of feedbacks, physiological ones of the sort I told you, and they've worked. Now, the essence of resilience in ecosystems, in agricultural systems, is to understand the feedbacks that keep it self-organizing in the way that we want it to.